So now after we have been looking at the escape, which is energy dependent of cosmic rays from the galaxy, where well, we observe that with increasing energy, more and more of the cosmic ray particles leak out of the galaxy. Let's have a look at the actual time, or let's say characteristic time, uh, over which cosmic ray particles escape. And there's a very ingenious way to measure this, as a matter of fact. Of course, we don't have really clocks, but we can get to clocks or to something similar as a clock if we look at radioactive, uh, radioactive isotopes. In order to use the radioactive decay of particles, of cosmic rays, we need an isotope which has a um, decay time that is sort of similar to the time scale that we are looking at. And one particular isotope is very, very useful for this, and that's 10 beryllium. So let's have a look at the lifetime of 10 beryllium. 10 beryllium is, of course, produced in spallation of um, heavier nuclei in an elastic cosmic ray scattering with interstellar medium. So 10 beryllium has a lifetime. We call this tau, 10 beryllium, or short just tau of 2.2 2 times, 2 .2 times 10 to the 6 years. So this is not too short. And in that case, um, cosmic rays would basically be gone if its residence time is more than 10 to the 6 years. And we have good reason to believe so, because if you remember, we estimated briefly so a number for the path length in the one slab model. And we found this to be of the order of uh, megaparsecs. So we're talking about at least millions of years. So 10 beryllium seems to be good uh, for this job. Now we can set up the equations again for um, the number densities of the uh, 9 and 10 beryllium. So 9 beryllium is stable. So we can compare these two with each other because they are produced in the same spallation processes. So let's set up the equations for this. For 9 beryllium, we have, let's call this N9, the number of 9 beryllium's, will uh, move out of the galaxy with an escape time tau e. So that's the escape time that we're looking at. And it will be also lost through um, spallation, so that 9 beryllium will be um, interacting in scattering, so it will be removed, and there we have the characteristic spallation time, tau nine, tau nine, we call it here. And then there's, of course, the term of uh, more heavy uh, nuclei which uh, do spallation to produce uh, nine beryllium. And this term I just call C9. This is a constant value. So C9 is defined as the sum of all nuclei with heavier uh, mass number. So no, so let's say uh, C9 is J larger than 9. So, you know, anything which goes higher could do spallation to produce an uh, beryllium 9. And then we have here the probability for um, anything which has um, mass number J to produce uh, 9 beryllium. And then we would have here some probability, oh, sorry, probability, that's the probability for the spallation, times the... Um, number of uh, particles of uh, mass number 9, uh, larger than 9, j, and then over the spallation time, 4j. So that will be basically just the sort of uh, term which produces the particles. And in uh, equilibrium, this would become 0, because we basically assume that we are sufficiently long out there so that basically they balance each other. For uh, the beryllium 9, uh, we've got uh, only the stable, we, this is the stable um, isotope. Let's take the same equations for beryllium 10. So we call that N10 and the number. That also is getting removed by escape. It's also getting removed by spallation. And it also gets removed by its decay. So we've got here also one additional term, which is only um, removed with this decay time. And then we got a source term like C10. And that's also, again, in stable equilibrium. Now, we can use these two equations, um, quite simple, they're just algebraic equations, to calculate the ratio of uh, N10 to N9. So then we get, after a little bit shuffling the terms around, 
for n10 over n9, we get the ratio of c10 over c9, so that makes sense. And then we get, I'll make here a line, it's a bit easier. And then we've got um, the escape time. Uh, we've got the spallation time. And we get down here also the escape time. We assume that these escape times are the same, right? So this is something which we put in here. Otherwise, you'd have to make two here, but then we would basically assume they are the same because otherwise it's a bit more complicated. But let's assume this is a universal escape time. And it only depends upon the charge number, so not on the isotope or the mass number. Uh, then we've got the spallation time, tau 10. And then we have the, um, the decay time. Now, if we, if we sort of sit at um, sufficiently high energies, the spallation time will be um, negligible. So they would be, you know, let's say they would not be negligible. The escape time, the escape time would be shorter than the uh, spallation time. So then we can simplify this to be then C10 over C9. And then we have only here the escape term divided by escape term plus decay time. So that means that we assume that T9 is much larger than TE and T10 is much larger than TE, so we can uh, neglect this. In principle, uh, we could also leave them in, but I just wanted to uh, make it easier to, to derive the equation. So then we can solve this for, for the unknown TE, because that's the quantity that we're interested in. And then we find TE equals tau times N9 divided by N10, so the, just the uh, inverse of that number, minus 1. And so that's telling us that we can basically read off if we have the ratio of n10 to n9, we just take the reverse of that one. Usually that's quoted in the literature. Um, and then we have uh, the known decay time, which is 2 times 10 to the 6 years, and then we can measure the escape time. So let's have a look at that, uh, what we get. So the measurements basically tell us that n10 over n9 so that's usually what's quoted, is range between about 0 0.1 uh, to about 0 0.3. So that's energy dependent. So that's for low energy and that's for high energy. And that means that our escape time, if we plug in the numbers, so this would be sort of at the level of uh, six or seven, uh, the inverse of that. So let's assume we're sort of in the middle between these two. So that would be something of the order of 15 million years. That's energy dependent, it goes up. So if you go, for example, 0 0.3, which is at the high energy end, then you would have here uh, three minus one is two. So it's only uh, like four times 10 to the six years. Okay, so, but this is sort of the average age. We're talking about several million years up to sort of 10 and uh, 10, 10 million years round about. And so this is just the, the average time. And now we can basically um, do, in, uh, do a, an additional calculation So now we can measure, remember we discussed before that we know Xi, that was five grams per square centimeters. And Xi was given by rho times the path distance. So this is a simple one slab model. Now we know the residence time, so we know how, how, how long the distance is that the cosmic ray particles propagate because they are basically relativistic. So that would be uh, rho times v times our escape time, because that's the average path length that we're dealing with. And then we can turn this around, and then we can calculate what rho is. And rho, let's make this the average rho, would be then of the order of 0 0.3 hydrogen atoms per cubic centimeter. And that is smaller than the average value which I quoted before for the galactic disk. So what happens is that the cosmic ray particles do not travel only through the disk, but they um, travel beyond the disk and then they return back. So they take some of their path is basically passing through the thinner gas outside of the disk. And that also tells us that the one slab model is basically uh, not even useful in a sense that we cannot just assume that they always move in one slab 
they will also pass through a denser medium to a thinner medium and therefore they will spend some of the time in a dense gas and some of the time in a not so dense gas. And so this is, this is kind of an interesting number because from that now we can infer how high this scale height is because the galaxy, as we saw it said before, has an extension of about 30 kiloparsec. The dense gas region is about 100 parsec, well, sort of 100 parsec around uh, the, the galactic disk. And so how far does this um, mean that cosmic ray particles move uh, beyond the disk in order to see an average value of 0.3 hydrogen atoms per cubic centimeter? And there we can do a very simple um, measurement. So we know, for example, um, that if we observe cosmic rays, not cosmic rays, sorry, if we observe X-rays towards the galactic pole, that is, we would be looking basically straight perpendicular to the galactic plane, so we would be looking through the gas as it extends beyond the disk, we find that the so-called column density of hydrogen that is given by integrating from zero to infinity because we look at sources which are very far away, and then we look at the photo um, absorption of the intervening uh, neutral gas of our galaxy. And therefore, we determine then the integrated column density because this absorption, photoabsorption effect, uh, depends upon the column density. So we can measure that. So this is then uh, the path integral way beyond the disk times the dens number density of the interstellar medium. And that turns out to be about 1.5 times 10 to the 23 hydrogen atoms per square centimeter. Okay, that's not the density, this is so-called number density. And if you now say that um, N, ISM, is sort of an exponential, so it's like, an, like, an, like, a, um, like a layer which drops off exponentially out of the disk, and this is a reasonable assumption. So this one would drop off with L over L0. Then you can calculate that the average number density as a function of the height over which you integrate, is given then 0 to h dl n ism divided by the integral from 0 to h dl. And so this value here would be essentially the column density if h is much larger than l0. So if h is larger than l0, then you would get here basically an h divided by h. And this would be the height. And this is the one that we're interested in. So, so we know the number density that's about 0.3 hydrogen atoms per cubic centimeter. So then we can basically use this n h, which we know from photoabsorption, which is 1.5 times 10 to the 23. And we, do, and we, we can then calculate uh, this height. So that will be the height of the cosmic ray disk. So let's say the cosmic rays are sort of living in a disk and then they escape, then this would give us an estimate of the height. And it turns out that if you take that number, uh, then you get h cosmic ray is nh divided by 0.3 per cubic centimeter, and then you get about 1.6 kiloparsecs. So it, it is substantially larger than the scale height, which is L0, which is about 100 parsec. Uh, so that, in hindsight, justifies this choice here. And it basically tells us also that uh, a substantial part of the cosmic rays are well outside of this um, dense gas, so they extend well beyond that. So the, the cosmic ray disk is quite, quite thick. And now this gives us a couple of very important conclusions so so or um, things that we can derive from that let's let's do one thing first before we uh, continue with our energetics considerations we can now use this height to determine the diffusion coefficient how do we do this well let's um, write down again what the diffusion coefficient is so the diffusion coefficient says that you know it basically tells us how far cosmic rays will diffuse away from the galactic disk in a given time tau. And what we now put in here is our escape time tau and the h squared we have, so we can determine the d, right? So that means d equals 
h squared divided by tau e. So there's maybe another factor one or two in there, but it doesn't matter. This is just giving us some sort of idea how large of a diffusion coefficient we have. And if you plug in the numbers, you get something which is three times 10 to the 28 centimeters squared per second. Of course, that number uh, will change because the escape time will become shorter. So therefore the diffusion coefficients will grow with increasing energy. But this is sort of the average value that we can uh, now take here. Now, um, this, is, this is interesting. I'm not going to go into many more details about this here at this point. If you compare this with the uh, mean free path of cosmic rays, assuming that they are uh, having as a mean free path a gyro radius in the magnetic field, this diffusion coefficient is by orders of magnitudes larger than that. We're talking about at least a factor of 1,000, even slightly more, depending upon how you just estimate this. So that means that the diffusion is not acting just like it's basically gyrating in the galactic magnetic field. And that's also somehow extend understandable, given that cosmic rays, when they are being deflected by the magnetic field, it depends upon the structure of the magnetic field. There's also a large-scale structure of the magnetic field which traces out the spiral arms. And a cosmic ray particle, which will be deflected by such a spiral arm, will basically gyrate around the spiral arm. So it will, perpendicular to the, uh, to the arms, have a very small diffusion coefficient because that's the gyro radius. But uh, along the momentum of the particle, basically parallel to the, to the B field, the diffusion coefficient will be huge. Basically, the particle moves freely, it's just bending slightly uh, with the curvature of the galactic arms. So therefore, we can immediately understand that the diffusion coefficient will be directional dependent, specifically if you have a large-scale B field. But that makes the story quite complicated. I just didn't want to go into it. What the data tells us is the truth, because that's the diffusion coefficient we estimate on average. So that will be sort of the average diffusion coefficient. Now, there's another reason why we should care about that number, the 1.6 kiloparsecs, because now we can basically say the volume, so with, with this H cosmic ray, we know we can estimate the volume in which cosmic rays exist. And that would be, let's assume we just have a very cylind simple cylindrical um, system, then we can say that would be pi r squared times H cosmic ray. So here we use the disk radius, so that will be 15 kiloparsecs, and this is the H cosmic ray, which is 1.6 kiloparsecs. So we assume it's basically a cylindrical volume, and um, so this we can calculate, and then uh, we know the energy density. So we measure the energy density. This was something I discussed several lectures before, and we find this is about one electron volt per cubic centimeter. As it turns out, that number is reasonably constant across this volume that we're talking about. So it's not a bad estimate. It tends to be slightly larger when you go towards the central part of the galaxy, and it tends to become less uh, when you go further out to the anti-center of the galaxy. But one electron volt per cubic centimeter is well representative to give us an estimate of the average energy density. And then, once we know that, then we can calculate the total energy in cosmic rays. So that would be UCR times VCR. And with that, we know with the escape time, the power that is required to, uh, uh, to, to um, produce the cosmic rays which are escaping. You need to replenish it. And that was the thing which we discussed several slides ago. So we know the cosmic ray power from this. That's ECR divided by tau escape. And that turns out to be about three times 10 to the 33 watts. Or if you want to put that in terms of luminosity of the sun, so that would be about 10 to the seven solar luminosities. And that's basically the benchmark number that we have to compare with whatever we find as a candidate for an accelerator. So, so let's go on a little bit and consider possible candidates. I mean, I'm not claiming that we know fully which candidates would be around, but let's just grab two possible candidates and look down whether they could fulfill the energetics. Because the requirement is that we need an accelerator which provides that much power in terms of charged cosmic rays, which then need to be accelerated to follow a power law spectrum. Okay, so let's, let's start with candidates. 
for a moment. So candidates for cosmic ray sources that need to fulfill these two fundamental requirements. That is, they need to be sufficiently powerful and they need to produce power law spectra. Now, as I said, I just grabbed two. There's many, many other candidates that you can consider. I'm not saying claiming that this is complete. We could also, for example, put pulsars and whatnot, but I'm just putting here two examples. So one example would be uh, wolf rayi stars. I'm picking out here one particular type of stars because they have a one uh, very, 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 very unique and very important property because they drive a strong stellar wind. And this is uh, something that can be measured through the spectra of the um, of the wind emission because these are broadened from the from the relative motion of the wind. And the estimates that we get is that the uh, velocity at uh, infinite distance is of the order of 10 to the 3 kilometers per second. So this is not relativistic, but still it's, it's, it's a very large velocity. If you compare that with the wind velocity of, for example, our sun, which is so like 100 kilometers per second, and that's not even the asymptotic velocity, this is the velocity at Earth. And then um, the mass loss rate, that's usually expressed as m dot, is driven by about 10 to the minus 5 solar masses per year. So this phase actually, that the star is in a wolf year phase, is very short, and it's at the end of a long, of, of, a, of the already short lifetime of a, um, uh, of, of massive stars. So this is just giving you an example of what you can do. You know the numbers now, so the velocity is there, so we know the, um, uh, the mass loss rate, so we can determine what the power is in the wind. So the power in the wind of a star, of a wolf Rayet star, can be up to 10 to the 30 watts. So that means that in order to drive, for example, cosmic rays, you would need at least a thousand wolf Rayet stars operating at every single time. And then you would just balance with the wind velocity, wind power, the actual power that is required to inject cosmic rays. If you want to accelerate cosmic rays, you can probably not convert the entire energy into cosmic rays because you also have the, the PV type uh, work that you do because you expand in the interstellar medium. Um, and only a fraction of this will be converted to uh, particle acceleration. So this is really putting quite a strong constraint on, on the number of wolf ray stars and the efficiency. So this makes it a little bit difficult, but some part of the wolf ray stars may actually contribute to cosmic rays. So th and there's good reasons also to look at that because of some particular um, uh, abundances of, of isotopes of, of, of neon, for example. Let's take another one, which is very promising, which we will talk about more in detail later, and that are supernova remnants. So any supernova, whether it is a nuclear type uh, supernova like a 1A, where you have a white dwarf essentially uh, um, explode, not explode, deflagrate in a uh, thermonuclear runaway reaction, or whether it is the gravitational collapse of a, of a, of a core collapse supernova, they both tend to have, in the end, a shell which is uh, expelled into the interstellar medium, which carries an almost identical amount of kinetic energy away. And that kinetic energy, which we call here SN, so that's the kinetic energy of the supernova, has even got its own uh, um, uh, unit to it. It's called FOE. So FOE stands for 10 to the 40, um, 51 ERC. And uh, that corresponds to about 10 to the 44 joule. So that's the energy which is carried away by this expanding shell. So that's kinetic energy. And we can now basically go ahead and estimate how much kinetic energy or what's the power with which this energy is uh, dissipated. So PSN is given by the energy of each individual supernova times the rate with which supernovae are produced. I call this here n dot. So that's the number of supernovae per unit time. And that's a difficult number to estimate. There's various ways to do this. For example, we could look at certain isotopes which are produced and uh, this kind of ex ex explosion like iron isotopes, which can be used. And then through the measurement of the radioactive decay line of this iron isotope, one can estimate how much is around. And we can also, of course, look at other galaxies and uh, simply look at how many supernovae we see. 
And uh, then basically uh, picking out galaxies, host galaxies of similar type like ours, we can then estimate the rate. So the typical rate would be of the order of one to three supernova per century that we would expect. This is quite a high number, surprisingly high number, if you think about it, that the last visible uh, or uh, visual supernova that we observed were the was the Kepler supernova and maybe the Cassiopeia supernova a little bit later, but that's already several centuries away. So we should expect very soon a supernova going off in our galaxy. And keep in mind that if you take the upper value, like three supernova per century, you would expect about one every 30 years. And if you then take into account that um, for at least quark collapse supernova should be seen, even though they may not be visually uh, evident, through the neutrino emission. And all the neutrino detectors would be seeing such a supernova. And they've been online for se for several decades, and they haven't seen a neutrino burst coming from a galactic supernova. So basically, we can say with some uh, with some confidence that we are at least unlucky, or maybe lucky, depends on how you look at it, that we haven't had a nearby supernova. Um, but it could happen. So we should be able to see maybe one during our lifetime. That's sort of the expectation that we can have. Um, so then basically, uh, you know the uh, total power that uh, supernova can create. And if we then convert some fraction, and we call that fraction, let's say eta is an efficiency, into cosmic rays, we can say that cosmic ray power from supernova is given by PSN times eta. And eta is efficiency of converting kinetic energy of the bulk motion to cosmic rays. So that's a number between 0 and 1. And now we can go one more step, which is interesting, to see how big eta needs to be with all these numbers that we plug in in order to produce the cosmic ray power that we expect. So we set this equal to PCR, the cosmic ray power. Then we can say that eta has to be at least, that's the minimum value that we can expect, 10% for an assumed cosmic ray power of 10 to the 33 watts, and a kinetic energy of each supernova of 10 to the 44 joule. So this goes with minus 1, because the larger this one is, the, uh, the smaller the efficiency would be, need to be, times the rate with which supernova explode divided by one every century. And that also goes with minus one, because if that number increases, then we need less um, efficiency for converting kinetic bulk energy into cosmic ray energy. And that's basically setting the stage now to look at acceleration processes, which seem feasible and possible to produce a power law type energy spectrum that we need to explain with a source which has sufficient power to provide and to inject uh, and also then produce the right particle spectrum so to match the one that we observe.